join Forum IS Academy, trusted by hundreds of toppers, including IS Rank 1 Shruti Sharma. Good evening aspirants, welcome to the Hindu News Analysis Discussion brought to you by Forum IAS for the date 6th June 2023. These are the list of news articles for today's discussion. We will be covering 5 topics from International Relations, Science and Technology, Internal Security and a topic from Governance. Apart from that, we will also be covering 2 previous year prelims questions at the end of the discussion. So with this straight away, let us move to our first article. First topic. I on oil. India must bring pump prices of petrol and diesel in line with global oil prices. The news is that the groupings OPEC plus agreed to extend the ongoing production cuts in the year 2024 also. The groupings has taken such a decision as it seeks to keep oil prices from falling amid concerns about the global economic slowdown. In addition to this, the OPEC leading producer Saudi Arabia also voluntarily came up with the decision to reduce oil output by an extra 1 million barrels per day in the month of July. Also more than 20 nation OPEC plus in April announced that additional output cuts amounting to 1.66 million barrels per day will be done before knowing the implications of cutting the oil output let us know about how oil prices are decided and about the opec and opec plus in detail first let us see how oil prices are decided see it is based on supply and demand the concept of supply and demand is the mechanism by which the prices of crude oil are controlled OPEC as producers have no influence over the demand for petroleum but the groupings OPEC tend to change its supply in order to influence the price. In order to keep prices of oil stable, the organization for petroleum exporting countries usually maintain a quota of oil supply. Another mechanism of pricing is the future supply based on some speculation. These are the supply and demand based on speculation of suppliers and consumers. Now let us see what is this OPEC. See the organization of the petroleum exporting countries was founded in Baghdad of Iraq. It was founded with the signing of an agreement in the year 1960 by five countries. They are Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. These five countries were to become the founder members of the organization. Know that OPEC is a permanent intergovernmental organization and the OPEC objective is to coordinate and unify petroleum policies among member countries. This is done in order to secure fair and stable prices for petroleum producers. They also ensure an efficient economic and regular supply of petroleum to consuming nations besides a fair return on capital to those investing in the industry. Another important fact is that it is headquartered in Vienna which is located in Austria. Also know that OPEC membership is open to any country that is a substantial exporter of oil and which shares the ideal of the organization. Now coming to the OPEC plus, OPEC plus is a group of 24 oil producing nations. This includes 14 members of OPEC and 10 other non-OPEC members including Russia. The 10 other non-OPEC members includes countries like Azerbaijan, Bahrain, Kazakhstan, Malaysia, Mexico, Oman, Russia, South Sudan, Sudan and Brunei. The format uh, OPEC plus was born in 2017 with a deal to coordinate oil production among the countries in a bid to stabilize prices. Since then the group has reached deal for members to voluntarily cut and ramp up production in response to the change in global oil prices. Know that the OPEC bloc is nominally led by Saudi Arabia which is the group's largest oil producer while Russia is the biggest player among the non-OPEC countries. Now coming to the implications part, for India which imports more than 80% of its crude oil requirements, the combined Saudi come OPEC plus announcement of supply curtailment or a cause of concern. 
because low oil output or decrease in oil production will push up the global oil prices. Thereby, oil prices in India might also increase in future. But know that India sharply increased its purchase of crude oil from Russia since Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. As a result of this, the price that India pays for an imported barrel of oil has been steadily declining. But we cannot say that oil prices will be declining all the time in spite of this production cut from OPEC plus countries. See, since India imports nearly 85% of its uh, crude oil requirement, sometimes even the oil import bill rise on account of the rise in prices due to decreased production. At those times, the rise in import bills not only lead to inflation, but it will also lead to rise in current account deficit, fiscal deficit, and as well as it will weaken the rupee against the dollar and hurt market sentiments. Secondly, as per the Investment Information and Credit Rating Agency, for every US dollar 10 per barrel increase in the price of Indian crude oil basket, the current account deficit would widen by 0.4 percentage of GDP. If we take the other impacts, this production cut move will impact on US as well. The move is likely to be highly uh, detrimental to the United States which has repeatedly asked the organization to increase oil production. Next is that the production cut could have an impact on non-OPEC countries that rely on oil exports as they may face increased competition in the market. These are the implications. Further, we already saw no because uh, we import from Russia, we are insulated from increase in international crude oil prices. Here, the editorial is saying that the reduction in crude prices has not percolated to the Indian co consumers. It is substantiated by saying that pump prices of petrol and diesel have remained unchanged since the month of May 2022. But the prices of crude oil that we buy has decreased. This is said to cause inflationary erosion in consumptive capacity because people are spending more on petrol and diesel which goes as revenue to governments and private industries. To avoid those erosion in private consumption, the editorial suggests that center should go for a fiscal expansion by cutting its taxes or levies on key transport fuels. So this is the uh, suggestion that is given in the editorial. So from this uh, article we saw about OPEC, OPEC plus and also the mechanisms uh, how the oil prices are uh, decided. Then we also saw about the implications of recent move of uh, OPEC plus. So with this let us close this article here. Second topic in the short term stabilize the line of actual control. This opinion section highlights the Doklam and Galwan crisis that happened in last few years. It says that the situation on the line of actual control has continued to remain extremely tense. We also know, right, most often the media reports the incident of uh, transgressions and standoffs between India and Chinese uh, troops happening at the line of actual control. It happens even as both countries are incurring huge expenditure as they induct men, material and equipments close to line of actual control. Such high expenses are set to ensure defensive preparedness as well as better military infrastructure. But in spite of it, incidents of transgression and standoffs between Indian and Chinese troops are happening at line of actual control. Here, the author tells why do both uh, countries need stability in the LAC region. Firstly, the state of aggressive interaction between both the power centers are not sustainable and can only trigger a major conflict. This could ultimately lead to destabilizing the entire region and adversely impact the world politically as well as economically. Therefore, it is in everyone's interest that LAC is made stable and the two giant neighbors which are the India and China see a friendly rise. Secondly, the complexity of the India-China border problem makes it impossible for a permanent solution on an immediate basis. We must know that Chinese uh, territorial claims includes the entire uh, Arunachal Pradesh and the occupied Akshay Chin region. Unfortunately, no Chinese government is likely to 
give up its claims over Ladakh and Arunachal Pradesh because China has long ago set a narrative that Ladakh and Arunachal Pradesh are two of the five fingers that are attached to Tibetan palm. Similarly, the Indian political establishment is not in a position to make any concessions to facilitate a mutually acceptable border settlements. How can India give up its claims on western and eastern section? So the author says it is better that both sides consider taking short term solutions with pragmatic steps to stabilize the LAC region and so thereby they could reduce the possibilities of a conflict. See for India it is all more important that LAC disputes do not escalate into full fledged conflicts because there is no surety that the result of war will be favorable to India. And moreover, we have to divert most of our finances to defense and war purposes which are not going to yield anything productive in return. Now, coming to the uh, inadequacies that both countries are facing. See, after the visit by the then Indian Prime Minister to China in the year 1988, four agreements have been signed between two countries in order to maintain peace along the LAC region. Know that for more than two decades, these arrangements, that is, these four agreements have served their purpose well. But however, the increase in tension on the LAC suggests that these agreements are inadequate to deal with the crisis anymore. And moreover, the agreements that were signed previously are based on the premise that the LAC is mostly defined and understood by both parties. However, this is not the case now and there are large segments which lack clarity now. As a remedial measure, let us see what the author has to say. Firstly, the author says, whatever be the reason, the situation needs to be brought under control and chances of full-fledged conflict should be minimized and avoided. Secondly, he suggests to convert the LAC region into a line of control by delineating it on the map and as well as on grounds without prejudice to the border claims. He thinks this will reduce the urge among the forward troops to inch forward and reduce any chance to acquire the land further. This may seem difficult but can be implemented with the use of technology and moreover India and China should be handling it in a matured way. Thirdly, the disputed area on the LAC can be treated as no entry zone. Alternatively, both sides should be allowed to patrol these areas as per mutually agreed frequencies. Then the author says, joint patrolling of the disputed areas must be allowed to explore as it can result in maintenance of status quo and thereby it could also lead to increase in confidence between both the countries. Finally, the opinion suggests that existing confidence building measures and engagement mechanisms needs to be strengthened. For this, the author suggests strengthening working mechanism for consultation and coordination on India-China border affairs that was created in the year 2012 and adds on to suggest establishing more uh, border personal meeting points so that local issues can also be resolved quickly. So this is what the author has suggested in order to reduce the conflicts in the region. So from this news article we saw about the uh, uh, incidents surrounding line of actual control and suggestions that were provided by the author. So with this let us close this article here. Third topic dealing with deep fakes. You all would have come across a fake photo that was circulating on social media last week. Photo appeared to show four of the protesting wrestlers posing with wide smiles for a selfie in the van. That is a fake one that is done using deep fake technology. From this picture you can see here. This is the original photo and this is the fake one which was done using deep fake technology. So in this context let us know more about deep fakes. See deep fakes are digital media. Uh, which could be either video, audio or images that are edited and manipulated using artificial intelligence. Even cloud computing, public research, AI algorithms, abundant data and availability of vast media have provided the option to manipulate the media. This synthetic media content is referred to as deep fakes. Know that artificial intelligence generated synthetic media or deep fakes have benefits in certain areas such as education, film production, criminal forensics and artistic expression. However, there are more problems associated with it than its benefits. 
Now, let us see what are the problems associated with uh, deep fakes. First is targeting women. According to a report, 96% of, of deep fakes are pornographic uh, videos. Deep fake pornography exclusively targets women, which reduces women to sexual objects causing emotional distress, financial loss, and consequences like job loss. Secondly, deep fakes can also create short term and long term social harm. For example, it can depict a person as indulging in antisocial behavior and saying bad things that he or she never did. Thirdly, deep fakes can also be misused by a nation state. Deep fake could uh, be used by a nation to harm public safety and create uncertainty and chaos in the target country. So deep fakes can undermine trust in institutions and diplomacy. Next is the misuse by non-state actors. Deep fakes can be used by non-state actors such as insurgent groups and terrorist organizations to show their provo provoking speeches or such actions to create anti-state sentiments among people. If we take other uh, concerns associated with deep fakes, deep fakes can be used to damage reputation, fabricate evidence and defraud the public and undermine their trust in democratic institutions. As said earlier, pornographic deep fakes reduce women to sexual objects causing emotional distress. No, it could also lead to financial loss and collateral consequences like job losses. So deep fakes can also cause uh, short term and long term social harm, accelerating the already declining trust in the traditional media. Then know that leaders may also weaponize deep fakes and use fake news and alternative facts to dismiss an actual piece of media and truth. Here the article says that in spite of its negative implications, there are certain advantages with uh, deep fake tech as well. To make that work in a positive fashion, you must also know how to deal with the negative implications of deep fake technology. Now let us see the solutions to counter the menace of uh, deep fakes. See firstly, media literacy efforts must be enhanced to cultivate a discerning public. For that, media literacy for consumers is the most effective tool to combat disinformation and deep fakes. We also need meaningful regulations with a collaborative discussion with tech industries, civil society and policy makers to develop legislative solutions. Only such efforts can help disincentivize the creation and distribution of deep fakes. Then we need easy to use and accessible technology solutions to detect deep fakes authenticate media and amplify authoritative sources. Fourthly, deep fakes must be included under hateful manipulated media, propaganda and disinformation campaign. In addition to that, journalists should be provided with tools to examine the authenticity of images, videos and audio recordings. For that, they would require proper training and resources. Finally, know that policymakers need to understand how deep fakes can threaten polity economy, culture, as well as communities. So the best way to deal with this menace is AI backed technological tools should be used to detect and prevent deep fakes. These tools must be invented by the countries in cooperation as soon as possible because these technologies are even capable of invoking war among countries in this information age. In that line only, the article has also highlighted how China has responded in a strongest way. See, China has banned deep faked visuals if its creators doesn't have permission to modify the original material. This is one way of countering the menace of deep fakes. So this is what the article has to say. So from this news discussion, we saw about deep fakes, the problems associated with it and the solutions in order to counter the menace of deep fakes. With this, let us close this article here. Fourth topic the decade-long search for a rare Higgs boson DK continues. Recently, physicists working with the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Europe reported that they had detected a Higgs boson decaying into a Z boson particle and a photon. This is said to be a very rare decay process that tells us important things about Higgs boson as well as about our universe. Before moving further, let us know about the Large Hadron Collider and about Higgs boson particle. First is about Large Hadron Collider. See, it is the world's largest and highest energy particle collider. 
It was built by European Organization for Nuclear Research between the years 1998 to 2008 in collaboration with nearly 10,000 scientists. Know that the accelerator lies in a tunnel which is 100 meters underground at CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research on the Franco-Swiss border near Geneva, Switzerland. The purpose of this Large Hadron Collider is to study minuscule subatomic particles that are smallest known units of matter and the building blocks of all things. If we take the working, the collider works by involving and sending beams of protons. You know right, protons are positively charged particles present in the nucleus of atoms. So beams of protons are sent speeding towards each other at nearly the speed of light in 27 kilometer ring of the Large Hadron Collider. Then scientists will record and analyze the collisions of the particle in the two beams as part of the experiment which will be used to study dark matters, dark energy and other mysteries in the universe. If we take the achievements of Large Hadron Collider, by the year 2012 scientists at CERN announced to the world the discovery of X boson or the Gauge particle during the Large Hadron Collider's first run. This led to Peter Hicks and his collaborator Francois Englert being awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics in the year 2013. So that is the achievement which scientists have made using Large Hadron Collider. Now let us see about Higgs boson particle. See Higgs boson is the fundamental particle that is associated with Higgs field. Higgs field is a field that is uh, uh, that gives ma mass to other fundamental particles such as electrons and quarks. Know that Higgs boson is also popularly referred to as God's particle. Now if we take the mass of Higgs boson, the Higgs boson has a mass of 125 billion electron volts, meaning that it is 130 times more massive than a proton. Then the charge of uh, Higgs boson, if we take, Higgs boson is chargeless. Then another matter of fact is that Higgs boson has an intrinsic angular momentum or spin of zero which means the Higgs boson is the only elementary particle with no spin at all. Now if we take the consequences of the discovery of Higgs boson, the Higgs boson has, has been the key in resolving the mystery of origin of mass. Then the confirmation of Higgs boson helps to explain how two of the fundamental forces of universe they are the electromagnetic force as well as the weak force that are responsible for uh, radioactive decay can be unified. Then the mass of Higgs boson is a critical part for the calculation that foretells the future of space and time. They know that the CERN result indicates that our universe isn't in a perfectly stable state. We saw right the Large Hadron Collider creates a Higgs boson by accelerating billions of highly energetic proton into a head-on collision. During this process, it releases a tremendous amount of energy that condenses into different particles. As it is a heavy particle, the Higgs boson is unstable and it decays into lighter particles. In that fashion only, a new theory which is the standard model says that Higgs boson will decay to a Z boson and a photon 0.1% of the time. This means that the Large Hadron Collider should create at least 1000 Higgs bosons to spot one of them decaying to Z boson and a photon. This is what the researchers have found recently. They say that this is a very rare decay process that tells us important things about the Higgs boson as well as about our universe. So that is all about the article here. Fifth and the final topic NIRF IIT Madras retains number one spot. The news is that the National Institutional Ranking Framework announced the India Ranking 2023 of Higher Education Institutions. In that, the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, remained the best educational institution in overall ranking for the fifth consecutive term. So in this context, let us know about NIRF. As Indian universities needed to be ranked based on Indian approach, the Ministry of Human Resource and Development which is now the Ministry of Education has set up National Institutional Ranking Framework NIRF. See, it outlines a methodology to rank institutions across the country. 
it is first of its kind that comprehensively assesses an institution and ranks higher educational institutions in India. If we take the key features of NIRF, it incorporates Indian approach to ranking. That is, it ranks institutions based on five broad parameters. They are teaching, learning and resources, collaborative practice and professional performance, graduation outcomes, outreach and inclusivity, as well as perception. These parameters are further elaborated into subcategories. Then separate ranking for different types of institutions depending on their areas of operations are also taken into account. See, ranking methods are provided for six categories of institutions. They are engineering, management, pharmacy, architecture, universities and colleges. Know that data obtained to measure the performance is such that it is easily available. So only verifiable data are taken into account. Then an independent and autonomous body, National Board of Accreditation is given the responsibility for undertaking the ranking process annually. Initially, it will be voluntary for institutions to sign up for the ranking process. That is also one of the feature. Then if you take the uh, advantages of such ranking mechanism, India specific ranking system would reduce the dependence on international agency ranking which does not take exclusivity and give rankings. Secondly, verifiable data would help in setting up a transparent ranking system. Then as it includes both public and private institutions, this ranking mechanism provides the actual status of higher educational institutions in the country so that students could make informed choices. Then this will help state as well as institutions for self-checking and to correct themselves, thus promoting excellence among the universities and other institutions. Finally, know that it is a step towards bringing the Indian institutes on a global platform. Then if we take the uh, cons associated with uh, ranking framework, the NRIF has no clear specifics about weightage that is given to India specific parameters. As it is voluntary in nature, not all institutions are covered in the ranking system. They know that disciplines like literature, commerce and social work appears to have left out of the ranking framework. Then broad based institutions such as IITs are often listed under the engineering category. They should have competed under the category of universities. That is what the experts are saying. Then there is lack of cross verification of data which affects the authenticity of data. While making the framework, the views of state funded and private institutions are not taken into consideration. Since this exercise, this ranking exercise is itself mostly done by the central institutions. No. So the views of state funded and private institutions are not taken into account, which is also said as one of the demerits of this ranking framework. Then if we take the way forward, first thing what has to be done is that normalization of performance index. That is normalization would help as there is huge resource gap between state funded and private institutions. Secondly, there has to be a separate scheme for central, state and private institutions which might be better and the private industries would be voluntarily made to compete with these state funded institutions. Finally, measures like extensive cross verifications, examinations of data, systematic and monitored surveys, inclusion of state representatives in NRIF team would help obtain a comprehensive ranking. So these are the uh, suggestions that could be taken into account for making the ranking framework more comprehensive and verifiable. So from this news article, we saw about uh, national institutional ranking framework in a comprehensive manner covering both the prelims and mains perspective. So with this, let us close the news articles discussion and move to the previous year prelims question discussion. Now coming to the uh, previous year prelims question, consider the first question with reference to Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, consider the following statements. The statements given are statement 1, AIIB has more than 80 member nations. Second statement, India is the largest shareholder in AIIB. Third statement, AIIB does not have any members from outside Asia. Which of the statements given above is or are correct? 
the options given are option A 1 only, option B 2 and 3 only, option C 1 and 3 only, option D 1, 2 and 3. The first statement given here is correct. Uh, but the third statement which is saying AIIB does not have any members from outside Asia is wrong because AIIB is a multilateral development bank with a mission to improve uh, social and economic outcomes in Asia and beyond. So the third statement is wrong. Only option A, one only is the right one. And know that uh, China holds 26.6 voting shares which is being the largest while India is the second largest shareholder in AIIB. So the correct answer for this question is option A, one only. Now moving to the second question, in India extended producer responsibility was introduced as an important feature in which of the following? The options given are option A, the biomedical waste rules, option B, the recycled plastic rules, option C, the e-waste management and handling rules, the option D, food safety and standards regulation of 2011. This is a fact based question. Uh, the correct answer for this question is option C, e-waste management rules. Uh, see the extended producer responsibility is a main feature of e-waste management rules uh, which says the producer of electrical and electronic equipments has the responsibility of managing such equipments after the end of life. So by this way the producer is responsible for their products once the consumers discards them. So the answer is e-waste management rules of 2011. So with this we have come to the end of uh, news articles and previous year questions discussion. With this let us wind up our discussion. Uh, if you like the method of teaching and if you can understand the concepts well, please give like, share, comment and subscribe to Forum IAS channel in various social media platforms for further update. Thank you for listening.